it's been a few months since this book came out, but I've only just finished it. The biggest reason why, well, the only reason why, is that I've been very hesitant to jump on the Apprentice's Quest bandwagon. I just felt that there was nowhere else they could go with it after the final battle between heaven and hell. What could you possibly do to top that? Um, the second circle of Cat Hell? But wait, wasn't there a fifth clan that we kind of neglected? And everyone has been asking if they would ever join the rest of the clans again? Oh, okay, let's do that. And yes, it does sound like a very interesting premise to have Sky Clan come into the main series picture, but for me, it still didn't feel like enough. So, despite my doubt, I kept hearing from everyone how amazing the new series was, how it was actually breathtaking and intriguing, just like the old books. And I was hesitant to believe them, considering this is the same fandom that thought Sunrise was amazing. But I decided to put my money where my mouth was and check it out. And it was meh. Extremely meh. For the book that was supposed to be the roaring return to the triumph of the old days, I was expecting a lot more. I had my suspicions with this arc from the very start after reading the Apprentice's Quest summary shortly before release. It's no secret that when the Aarons don't have any ideas or they need to pad out their material for a six book arc, they'll send them on a journey somewhere. And more times than not, it is painfully boring. I feel like the only time the quest outline completely worked was in the new prophecy. So when I heard they were starting off a vision of shadows with another quest book, I just couldn't bring myself to read it. I knew it was going to be dull. And apparently, a lot of reviewers on Goodreads agree. They're tiring out, out of the same old copy-paste c- cliches like me. And then there's the idiots that don't think about what they're reading and keep encouraging this half-assed formula writing from authors and publishers. You are part of the problem. So, maybe this book is where A Vision of Shadows really takes off? There has to be a reason why so many Warriors fans unanimously told me that Thunder and Shadow was amazing. Well, I got about a hundred pages in when I figured it out. Thunder and Shadow is not a thrilling, thought-provoking, or suspenseful novel on its own. It just blatantly copies the warrior books that were. A later who snaps from a moment of extreme stress, becoming increasingly hostile and paranoid, inadvertently causing death and forcing his clanmates to go behind his back to do the right thing. Oh, where have I read that before? Then we have the moment where a Shadow Clan takes a Thunder Clan apprentice hostage in order to get a herb they need to cure their clanmates of a deadly sickness. They already did that in Night Whispers. We already have a lot of Hollywood reboots and sequels that lazily steals their predecessors' plots, but I'm very surprised that books seem to be doing it now, too. And it only affirms to me that the Aarons have run out of ideas, and just like Hollywood, the originals did it better. With Blue Star, we saw in every book what a wise, confident, and strong leader she was, making the change into a paranoid, angry shell of her former self all the more jarring. One Star already made a lot of dumb decisions in the past, usually caused by his pride and patriotism getting in the way of good judgment. So this really doesn't seem like a total breakdown, it just feels like another typical One Star rant, except much more extreme. Then there's the hostage situation. I'll admit, there were some things that worked about it better than in Night Whispers. Back in Omen of the Stars, the only cat that was seriously ill was Little Cloud, so the sense of urgency was much lower. Making Shadow Clan seem like less like good guys driven mad with desperation and more like heaps of fox dungs who resort to extremes at the drop of a hat. Here, half of the clan is sick, and it is nailed home that they will die without a cure. Deaths that they can't afford with half their apprentices defecting to the rogues. This makes their desperation real, but in the end, they still find a way to fumble with it. When Shadowclan discovers Twigpaw in their camp, they are more than ready to escort her home. But Scorchfur, the annoying ball of cat vomit whose only job the entire novel is to complain about everything, suggests using her as a hostage to get Thunderclan to convince Windclan to hand over the herb, since Thunderclan has a close relationship with One Star. Um... Did they forget about that time when One Star led an invasion against ThunderClan just to prove that he wasn't buddies with them? What makes them think this would work on any level? But even stupider than that, everyone immediately agrees to it. Even Tawny Pelt, the voice of reason, 
What? The change in attitude among the entire clan is so swift it's unbelievable. Surely there would be at least one cat that would object to kidnapping? You know, like Tawny Pelt? The cat who always thinks things through and tries to resolve conflicts diplomatically? Not quickly agree to rash ideas with demissive phrases like, It makes sense? It makes sense? No, Tawny Pelt, it doesn't make any sense! And this isn't just an issue with this one scene. The entire novel has terrible pacing. I found the dead canary in the opening pages, when Dovewing and Tiger Hearts very conveniently meet during the Border Patrol after Border Patrol, flip-flopping between being happy to see each other and hating each other. Right near the end of the novel, when Tigerheart bumps into Dovewing again when he is on a mission with his clanmates to convince One Star to let them take the Lungwort, I just rolled my eyes in exasperation. It is so painful how the authors keep forcing these characters to meet just so they can ship tease the audience. Want to hear the news flash, Aarons? Come closer. A little closer. No one cares! No one has cared since Night Whispers! It's a terrible ship! Let it go! But that is nothing compared to the rest of the novel. When Twigkit wanders off to the lake to prove she's special and nearly drowns, Sparkpaw saves her. This leads to Bramblestar saying she's ready for her final assessment, and I thought to myself, wait, wasn't she an apprentice for only a few moons? That's really soon. Oh well, can't wait to see how she does her assessment, that will be cool. And then they cut to the clan cheering her warrior name, Sparkpelt. What? Why would they gloss over something like that? Instead, we get a short summary of how this normally very interesting ritual to read about went down for the overly gifted spark pelt. That is so lazy, and it perfectly encapsulates one of my biggest issues with this arc. Say what you will about the first four arcs of Warriors, but they all felt like a new generation succeeding the previous. As you were introduced to the protagonists, you got to see them grow as characters and learn where they belonged in their clan feeling like they've truly earned their full titles when they finally received it. This series has an obstacle to that as it starts after Bramblestar's Storm, which is written like it was an epilogue to the whole saga. But instead of trying to clear the obstacle, they took shortcuts. Oh, you saved one kit? Warrior! You spoke up for your beliefs one time? Medicine Cat! It's so rushed, it feels like the authors just wanted to get it over with so it doesn't really give you the chance to feel proud for them or feel like they're the worthy torchbearers of tomorrow. Rather, they're just afterthoughts, children of the real heroes, names to continue the family trees we seem obsessed with updating. It doesn't help that the protagonist is rather boring and one-dimensional. Don't get me wrong, if, if you like Al Alderpaw, I'll power to you, but I just can't bring myself to like him very much. He doesn't have any interesting personality traits other than being insecure. When he's not appealing to people with anxiety, he's just a generic, naive, nice guy. And where's the fun in that? Even Lion Blaze, obnoxious as he was when he was an apprentice, had some serious stuff going on that made it interesting for us readers to follow him. But that's not to say all the protagonists were dull. Twigpaw, despite having one of the most boring prefixes ever, was the most likable character out of this novel for me. She's so sweet and innocent. She assumes that everyone has the best intentions, which, more often than not, gets her into serious trouble. She's a lot like Dovewing when she was an apprentice in those regards. Yet she isn't all bubbles and sun sunshine. She will get angry, she will get upset, and usually for the right reasons, making it very easy to sympathize with her. After all, who wouldn't be angry after a group of superstitious cats takes you into their home and forcibly separates you from the only family you have left for the sake of a prophecy and... Oh my god, the clans have sunk to the tribe's level! Oh, um, sorry about that existential crisis. Let's move on! Twigpaw also brings out the best in Alderpaw's personality, or what little of it there is, as he always finds time to comfort her, proving to the readers time and time again that he is deeply compassionate and kind. Good traits for a medicine cat to have. And let's not forget about Violet Paw. She, too, was a very intriguing character. She starts off innocent and unassuming like Twig Paw, but thanks to the clan she grows up in, she quickly becomes jaded and emotionally isolated. 
Her, for lack of a better term, adoptive mother, Pine Nose, makes it clear that she loves her own kits over Vilapaw and thinks caring for her is just a chore. Rowan Star only cares about her place in the prophecy and barely treats her civilly, even going so far as to straight up telling her she was no longer welcome after Needlepaw takes her to the rogues. An immature move I can that I can only akin to? Oh, you're taking our kid to a dangerous place with dangerous cats without asking her what she wants? Fine, take her. She, she's useless anyway. We don't want her. Really, the only positive influence Vilepaw had during her kidhood was with Needlepaw, who is a really, really horrible role model. Yeah, there's the aforementioned taking of kid to an unsafe environment. But let's not forget the time when she sent Vilepaw, well, Kit at the time, out into the forest in the middle of the night just to send a message to her boyfriend that she wouldn't be able to see him tonight. Yeah, if it wasn't for the rogues, Violet Kit would have been eaten by an owl, you bitch. All of this alone would seriously damage any child's psyche. But even on top of that, she doesn't get to grow up with a sense of community with discipline and organization. All throughout the novel, we see how Shadow Clan is falling apart from Violet Paw's eyes. Apprentices constantly talk back to their mentors and don't do as they're told. The elders and kids are neglected. Sometimes they even get into serious fights which no one even attempts to break up. Over time, all of these combined elements warps Vilapon into a seriously messed up kid, who always keeps her emotions bottled up, expects everyone to hate her, and feels like she doesn't belong anywhere. Her progression toward this emotional husk is outlined every time she visits with Twigpaw. In the beginning, when Alderpaw and Needlepaw set up a secret meeting for them, they are both thrilled to see each other and play enthusiastically. But as the book goes on, Vilapaw starts to act more and more cold toward her sister. Although he knows she still dearly loves Twigpaw, but is too scared to show how she feels. Hmm. Saying all of this, Vilapaw is beginning to remind me of something. A cat whose lineage is a secret from everyone was raised in Shadow Clan by a cold, uncaring foster mother with equally indifferent foster siblings who was treated badly by their leader and quickly turned hostile because of it. Oh my god! Okay, this is the only time I'm going to be okay with the Aaron's rehashing an idea. Let's see Vilepaw grow up to murder Rowanstar and become the badass villain leader to whip Shadow Clan back into shape. Come on, people. Maybe Shade's getting lonely in the female villain's warrior's corner. Make it happen! But the time for that has not yet arrived. Right now, we have another villain at the center stage. What is he like? Darktail, the leader of the rogues that drove out Sky Clan from the gorge in the last book, was surprisingly a very intriguing antagonist. He has just the right amount of malice and mystery, saying that he knows the clan's dark secret and vows to destroy them after attacking a wind clan patrol resulting in First Pelt's death of one star losing a life. But he isn't evil without reason, either. In one of Vilapaw's chapters, when she's living with the rogues on the edge of Shadow Clan territory, we see Rain, Needletail's boyfriend, challenging Darktail. Their entire conversation caught me off guard, so I'll quote it instead of trying to awkwardly summarize it. You've been bringing less and less back to camp. He dropped the mouse. This is the most pitiful offering yet. Rain's eyes narrowed to slits. Have you been counting what I catch? Of course I have, Darktail hissed. I'm the leader of this group. I make sure every cat pulls his weight. You sound like a clan cat, Rain sneered. So? Darktail lifted his chin. They live well. If you like rules, Rain flexed his claws. Rules will keep our bellies full. And the argument goes on like this for a while more, but the last bit of dialogue I want to call attention to is Darktail's reasoning right before the fight. We don't need the pine forest yet, Darktail snapped. For now we've got everything we need, we need and we don't have to fight for it. We won't be taking over anyone's territory until I say so. I was very surprised when Darktail expressed these sentiments. It shows a certain amount of cunning and maturity to recognize your enemy's strengths and copy them in an attempt to beat them at their own game. And from the way this book ends, I think he succeeded. The last bit of dialogue shows that he's smart enough to recognize that biding your time and waiting for the opportune moment to strike will get you farther than constantly being on the offensive. See? You should take notes, Tigerstar. And then there's the fight between Darktail and Rain. Needletail's boyfriend proves himself to be quite a capable fighter, 
which makes Darktail seem all the more powerful when he beats him into submission. But just when you think that's the end of it, Darktail suddenly scratches out Rain's eye, nonchalantly explaining that half-blind cats don't threaten anyone before eating a rabbit for dinner like nothing happened. I love this scene. We get to see Darktail's savagery and desensitized view of violence firsthand, instead of just taking the word of a beaten up Wind Clan patrol. With one stroke, Darktail shows us what kind of villain he's going to be. A capable, strategic, impatient commander with a vicious attitude to back up his harsh policies and keep his followers in line. Hmm. Putting it that way, Darktail is starting to remind me of another awesome villain. Oh. Well, that takes the air out of it a little. But at least this shows that the Aarons still recognize what struck a chord with the fans in the past. Despite being Scourge 2.0, Darktail is still a threatening and entertaining villain on his own. But there's still something about this scene that rubs me the wrong way. Violetpaw, disturbed by what she saw, runs out of camp and vomits behind a tree. Feeling nauseous after witnessing gore or violence is more of a human reaction than cat. Yeah, I know, the whole premise of warriors is about intelligent anthropomorphic cats. But as the series went on, the Aaron slowly abandoned the other side of the coin that made warriors unique. Their animal and territorial instincts. Think about how many times border patrols met on the border and started to accuse each other of prey stealing or trespassing if there was so much of a whiff of their rival scent wafting over the border. Pretty pointless, right? Well, it seems pointless to us because we're humans. Cats are innately territorial creatures, and rarely greet each other with politeness in the wild. Warriors is special because while the cats are heightened in intelligence and logical thinking, they still had that violent and territorial instincts that usually escalated into battles, often resulting in meaningless feuds fueled by a combination of pride, patriotism, and animal instincts that compelled them to fight, a theme that humans can connect with deeply. But by making the characters more human, it cheapens the wild atmosphere and makes the whole premise feel moot. If they're going to be humans trapped in cat bodies, why not just make them human? I'm telling you, this human conversion crap needs to stop now. Hashtag make warriors great again. So, in summary, Thunder and Shadow is a shameless ripoff of an other warrior books, taking plot points and themes that were already explored and doing it worse neutering beloved characters in the process. Two out of three of the protagonists are sympathetic and interesting, and the villain is outstanding, so at least they have that going for them. It still isn't enough to save this novel from its dumbed-down dialogue. I mean, come on, do we really need it beaten through our heads that Tawny Pelt is Bramble Star's sister like we're four years old and drooling out of our mouths? And awful pacing. If I have to give this book credit for one thing, is that it actually got me to feel for Tigerheart. He was willing to swallow his pride and beg One Star for the sake of his clan, and defended his father from Darktail without hesitation. Of course, that feeling was ruined with a certain announcement. Ugh. That's for another time, though. We'll be here all day if I get started on that bullshit. With all this in mind, I give Warriors Thunder and Shadow a 6 out of 10. It did a lot of things right, but overall it's just a lazy, by-the-numbers novel with the old Warriors books painted all over it in an attempt to, to distract the fans from the fact that it plagiarizes the great books of the past, rather than paying homage to it while it's doing its own thing. So I probably won't bother with picking up the rest of the series, but I'm definitely going to keep track of where it goes from here. If Ilopod doesn't become the new Broken Star, I am going to be very disappointed.